So I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for joining today for part two of our discussion about clinical trials. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get my slides up here to share with everybody. And we will um, get started. OK, so let's save on the current slide. There we are. Okay, so last time we were together, um, we had spoken about the fact that a lot of trials have moving parts, and we had um, talked about experimental designs and parts of the project plan, and I had shared with everybody a template to follow to help you develop your uh, project idea and your proposal and to actually think through all of the parts and the documents that you need uh, for your particular project. And so what I thought we would do today is focus a little bit on some of the administrative aspects of providing oversight, primarily in the role of a PI on a clinical trial, but certainly important for everyone on the team to understand what some of the administrative requirements are. And then I wanted to share some of my rules to live by to help people have a more successful trial. And then we'll answer any questions that you have. And so I'm, hold on, I want to I'm on the wrong set of slides. Sorry about that. Let me just kind of scroll down to where we should be today. So um, there we are. So for part two, I have a couple of learning objectives for us. We'll look at some of the contractual responsibilities that are associated with clinical trials. We'll talk about how to register a trial on clinicaltrials.gov. We'll talk about some roles and responsibilities of the PI. And then, you know, some aspects of training for the team who's going to be working on the project. And then, as I said, some of my rules to live by to help to ensure success. So we'll start first by looking at some some broad administrative responsibilities with any type of clinical trial. And the first and most important thing that all investigators should know is how critical it is to work with our sponsored programs office. So um, sponsored programs helps us to navigate the internal process with making sure all of the parties involved understand the contractual agreements that are being put in place, the agreements related to um, a grant award, for example, if you're working with private industry, you know, the, the, the management of proprietary information, things like that. So sponsored programs has multiple divisions within that department of the university. Um, and they help you with pre pre submission for grants, they can help you with that process with grant writing and all of those kinds of things, making sure you're following instructions and with the actual submission of the grant. And then the post award management of uh, managing your contracts, how you manage your budget and things like that. So um, fantastic. Uh, Sarah Cosgrove's here, part of our sponsored programs. Thanks, Sarah, for being here. Um, she works with me very closely on um, most of my projects. So I really appreciate you. Feel free to chime in, Sarah, if you can think of anything um, that you'd like to add. But I, I just wanted to let everybody know, um, when you are thinking about doing a clinical trial, you know, obviously you have to think about where is the funding going to come from. So there are certain contracts that will be associated with federal grants. And then if you work with industry, um, you, you want to have some documents in place as you're starting your initial discussions with that company because you know you're going to want to vet that um, company to see if if your interests and strategies align if if you have the right um, equipment the right personnel the right time frame to be able to collaborate together on a project and as part of those discussions, you're going to be likely talking about some confidential information. So to protect both the university as well as the company, you want to have a non-disclosure agreement put in place. Um, and then also a, mem a memorandum of understanding. And the MOU kind of outlines in a general way 
what the nature of the relationship is going to be. You know, are you going to do educational research? You're going to do product testing. You're going to engage in some human subjects research, clinical trials. What does that kind of look like? And then within the MOU, if you're going to have a, an agreement we're going to work together on some projects and this is what they're going to be. Each individual project then would have its own contract that is a part of the addendum of the memorandum of understanding. So again, our sponsor programs division can help you to navigate some of those things. And I've done this many times, so you're always welcome to contact me too if you have some questions and how you go about that process. Um, and then again, uh, all contracts, so all grants get routed through for approval before submission. And then uh, again, there's a lot of different checkpoints along the way with the contract once the contract has been awarded or the grant has been awarded. So just sort of the business end, if you will, of the clinical trial. Another wonderful thing that our sponsored programs um, group can help with is getting your clinical trial registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Now, this is actually a requirement if your study is federally funded. If you are working in private industry um, contract, it's actually a really good idea to register your trial there as well, because many of the scientific journals where we will eventually submit the results of the study for dissemination actually require that in order to publish the results of your trial that your trial has been registered on clinicaltrials.gov and um, you actually want to have your trial registered before you get up and operational. So we'll look um, a little bit uh, closer look at this. So here's the site, it's easy. You can Google this yourself, clinicaltrials.gov, and you can read a little bit about what the process is and you know what the intent is and to learn more about the timeframes. And I just took a snapshot of two of the studies that um, we've been doing here at ASDO. Um, and what I want you to see is that the status of the study is reflected when anybody searches your study and they can search it through the name of the principal investigator, they can search it through the name of the academic institution, or they can search it based on what the topic at hand is. And Sometimes we actually will will get emails from people who are interested in being subjects in a study because in this case we're looking at fluoride therapy and people with head and neck cancer so sometimes we'll hear from other institutions who maybe want to collaborate with us or maybe they want to refer um, somebody a patient of theirs who could maybe be eligible for enrollment in the study so the status of this study is something that that you control based on the phase of the study and it automatically comes up and it's a nice kind of um, tool to share with the broader scientific community of the work that you're doing and where you are in the course of the study. And then, of course, you change the status as you go through the study. So this was our big tooth whitening study that we did last year. And now that's completed. You know, obviously, the study is over. We're not enrolling anybody else. And the study is closed. Now, um, if you are designing your study and you have your proposal finished, but it still needs to have final approval by the IRB, you can still go ahead and get your trial registered a while. Um, and there's a certain status that you register your trial, um, which is essentially not yet recruiting. Then once you get your IRB approval, you can go in and change the status to recruiting and you can um, get up and operational a while. Now, every trial that gets registered in clinicaltrials.gov gets assigned a unique identifying number, and you always want to know what that number is and keep track of that. Um, some of the journals where you want to submit your work will actually want to know what that number is, and they want some kind of a, a way to verify that you, in fact, have registered your trial. So, um, again, sponsor programs, terrific to help navigate this process. It's not nearly as intuitive as I think we would hope it would be. Sometimes in my experience too, if we work with industry, actually the industry partner takes responsibility for registering it, but that's something that you wanna have a discussion about before the study even launches. So this is a really important aspect of conducting a clinical trial. And then as a principal investigator, it's your job to um, notify sponsored programs if they've helped you or to, to do this yourself, to go ahead and change the status Status, as the status of your study um, moves through different phases. All right, so um, 
let's now kind of take the 30,000 foot view and talk about different roles and responsibilities of the principal investigator because of course the the bottom line stops with the principal investigator who is then the point person for the entire study team for the study sponsor for the feds and for the university so honestly i have to tell you um I think it's almost equally amount of time and effort in work in the administrative management of a clinical trial as it is with conceptualization of, uh, conceptualization of the trial and implementation of the trial. You have to have eyes on all the different moving parts. So I thought it might be helpful to everybody to have what I think are the big areas that are really critical for a PI to have eyes on in an administrative role. And of course, I share all of these slides with you and feel free to use them as a resource and as maybe as a checklist for yourself if you're going to go down this road. So the PI is responsible again for all communications with the sponsor and with the university and also to ensure compliance with not only university policies, but also federal regulations. Um, and so because of that, the PI is going to work very closely with sponsor programs in all phases of the study. The PI is also responsible for oversight about all aspects of the study design and the project plan, including developing and managing the budget and thinking about whether you're going to designate to someone or you're going to work with somebody about ordering and oversight of equipment and supplies. And of course, we order supplies through our purchasing department for the university. But you also want to think about, um, you know, when are those deliveries going to arrive and where are we going to put all the supplies that we need? And do, does everybody on the study team have access to those and do they know where they're going to be kept? So when you're thinking about designing the project and the project plan, part Part of this is, you know, where are we going to keep everything that we're going to use as part of this study? So um, I know I work very closely with members of my team on a regular basis. We give each other a heads up. Hey, this is going to be delivered on this day and let's make sure somebody's there so we can put it where we want it to be stored. And I'll give you some um, examples of that in a little while. The PI is also responsible, as I said, for compliance with university policies. So it's important to know where to find them. So if you go into the portal and you, you know, type in university policies in the little search bar, it'll take you directly to the link. And while there are other policies that certainly apply to research, um, on the ones I have listed here for you on the slide, I think are the big ones and the ones that certainly um, I navigate with on a regular basis. So this, um, of course, relates to understanding conflicts of interest, how you as a PI may or may not be reimbursed for the work that you're doing in the trial. We certainly have a very nice policy about scientific misconduct and um, our commitment to preventing misconduct. Um, fees that may be associated with the IRB review, especially if the budget for the grant exceeds a certain dollar amount. And then um, again, if you are going to do a clinical trial where you're going to somehow incentivize the people to be in your study, maybe you want to give them a gift card or, you know, you're going to have a raffle for something and you, you give them some type of reward, there's actually paperwork, contracts where subjects have to sign that they have in fact received their gift card or whatever it is you're giving out to them because those incentives um, are tied to the budget of the study. And so there's a, a tracking mechanism and we want want to make sure that we can account for where the monies go and they have been spent appropriately for those things. And then you can read about the compensation policies of the university, how to comply with them. You can link to the paperwork and then um, learn where it gets submitted and how often. Right, so I think it's good to, to take a couple of minutes always to, to scroll through the university policies to become familiar with them. And I wanted to make sure everybody knew where to find them. So another large aspect of study administration is the creation and organization and storage of all of the documents that are used in the study. And this is an area that I think um, many researchers who have not done a clinical trial may underestimate the amount of work that goes along with this. So um, for example, 
you have to create all of your data gathering instruments, your screening forms that you're going to use, the internal tracking documents that you're going to use as the PI. You know, if I want to know how many of my subjects have had the first study visit, the second, the third, you know, how are you going to do that? Um, where is the code, if you will, for the unique identification numbers that get assigned to subjects? Because God forbid we have a really serious adverse event. We have to be able to, to know who that person is. We have to know uh, to which group they were assigned and what they were exposed to. So the PI has to have a way of being able to get access to that information in certain kinds of situations. So. Um, you also want to have spreadsheets that you create for tracking your data entry. So that's a really important part of your study documentation. And I strongly encourage all of you to do what I do, which meet with the biostatistician I'm going to work with before the study even launches to talk about what does that spreadsheet design look like, because the biostatistician will take that spreadsheet with all the de-identified and coded information and then input it into a statistical software program. So I always like to say, try and do all of this right the first time, but there's always going to be modifications and it's better to work through all of that upfront before you hit implementation. Um, your consent forms, of course, and all of your forms that you're going to use as part of data collection have to be appended to your IRB application. So sometimes, you know, the IRB will review it and they'll say, you know what, hmm, we think uh, you need to change this or we'd like to see you add something onto this form. Um, I would also encourage you to keep file folders electronically in your records where I'll have um, all the original IRB. IRB forms that get sent. And then I have another folder that says, you know, revised IRB documents. And then at, when everything's signed, sealed, and delivered, I have a, a folder that's all final documents. And this way I know that I am not only date coding those documents, but I know that once the study is launching, we're using the final version of every single document. So you figure out your own way of tracking that on your end, but your consent forms as well as other study documents that are approved by the IRB will actually be stamped. So it's important that you're going to use those. So I would create a folder where you have those so you always know which version of the form to use. And then you have to identify a physical space where if you have paper records, we often will have study binders, if you will, that have the paper copies of the consent forms and certain things we fill out at each study visit, almost like a patient chart. Uh, where are you going to keep that? Because they have to be kept in a locked file and in a way that complies with HIPAA, right, for all of the individuals who are going to be part of that study where we may be collecting um, uh, identifiable medical information. So here's just an example of a mouthwash study that Mark Schlossman and I um, have coming up in um, um, the future once we reopen fully to human subjects research. And you can see here, um, here's this example of how that consent form has the stamp of approval right, right at the top of that. So that's what I'm talking about if you've never seen that before. So as just like we talked about the security of oversight of your study folders for your subjects, you know, an important, important uh, part of administration is oversight for safety of all the information and compliance. So certainly consent and compliance with all of the terms for the IRB and making sure that you have forms and signatures that are on file the way you said you were going to do it. Uh, data security, compliance with HIPAA, uh, any other federal regulations that may apply to your study, that you have locked files with very limited access and you know who has access to them. And you may even want to, depending on the nature of your study, I've been involved in studies that were actually drug trials where you had to log in and out so they knew who went in and out of a cabinet to access study medications. So you have to really think about the nature of the trial that you're doing and what kinds of safety and compliance mechanisms need to be in place. Um, data entry is really important and this is part of your data management and also data security so that whoever on your team is going to be responsible for data entry that they're following the proper coding schema that has been established for the study. Um, 
depending on what you're doing, if you're doing a, a drug trial with um, FDA intent, maybe for the drug to be approved, or maybe they're looking for another approval for an indication, an extra indication for that drug, my experience is pharmaceutical companies always have used a study monitor. And those study monitors can come anytime they want, unannounced, right? That's part of the contract of doing those kinds of studies. And that means that your files must be current and complete at all times, right? So even some of the smaller product companies that I've worked with where we've done some clinical trials have also brought in an independent study monitor. Um, and my experience is the study monitor wants to see everything, including an actual binder that you put together for a subject. They'll flip through the whole binder. I've had study monitors change the kind of style of label that I put on the cover of the binder. I mean, they, they work for the sponsor and they have some of their own rules and quirks and they can come again at any time. So if, if you've enrolled some uh, subjects and you're missing a date on a consent form or you're missing um, an investigator's initials on a study visit form, uh, they can call you out on that. And that can actually be um, a problem to the point where they might interrupt the um, continuance of the study. So I always kind of live by that because I kind of grew up doing a lot of drug trials and making sure that at the end of every study visit and at the end of the day when you've been seeing subjects all day that all those files have been looked at, somebody checks for the signatures, they get locked and put away the way they're supposed to, right? So another part of safety compliance is adverse events monitoring and reporting and documentation. And um, there are reporting requirements for adverse events to not only to the IRB, but also to the study sponsor. And there are different degrees of severity of adverse events that um, have different levels of reporting requirements. This is um, a really critical aspect for all members of the study team to know and how you go about that process. And I'll share an example with you in a little while. So the other big administrative responsibility is oversight for all the study supplies. So not only purchasing them, but figuring out what do you need for each study visit? We call this the armamentarium, right? What are, what's the setups? What do you need? Now, of course, um, we have to really always be mindful about PPE. So part of the challenge in planning clinical trials right now is availability of PPE. Can you get what you actually need? That may actually influence the start date for you. Um, there's different levels of masks, for example, um, gowns, do you need disposable gowns, do you need disposable head covers, what do you need, right? So be thinking through all of that, because we also now need to be in compliance with our COVID mitigation strategies that we have put in place in our own individual schools and also at the university level. So, um, Study supplies also might mean whatever you're giving to the person to use, you know, do you have products you need them to use, are they labeled appropriately, um, you know, if you're going to give somebody six things to take home with them, should you put them in a Ziploc bag to make it easier, lots of times what we'll do is we'll prepackage things, almost like an assembly line and we'll put them in boxes and store them according to a, an, a given group so that on the the time we're going to see those subjects, we can grab and go and make sure everything that person needs is in that prepackaged um, setup. So think about that. What's going to make it easier for you? Are you seeing a subject off site? Are you seeing them in another building on the campus? How are you going to get stuff from A to B, right? So do you need boxes? Do you need a dolly? Do you need a cart? How are you going to do that, right? And then as the PI, you need to come up with a way to track and know who got the study supplies. You have to be able to verify that, in fact, everybody got what they needed. So I'm a huge fan of checklists. I think they are fantastic and they really can be used for 
virtually all aspects of a study, but I, I kind of have my own checklist as a PI for administrative things so that I have make sure I've done all of these things in addition to checklists that we might use for this study. So we're actually in the process of designing a very large study that we hope to launch in a few weeks with our colleagues at MOSDO, as well as our colleagues at KCOM in the um, microbiology department. It's a big dental aerosol study. And we actually just created eight checklists um, because there's stuff that happens in the laboratory, stuff that happens to prepare for a study visit, stuff to do during a study visit, stuff to do afterwards. So um, it helps everybody on the team um, think through the steps. And it also is really helpful to prevent errors in the implementation phase of the study. So here is just a, a snapshot off of the IRB's website. Um, we have such uh, a great IRB at our university, um, really have done such a good job at helping all of us to navigate this. I worked at four other major research intensive institutions before coming to ATSU. And I can tell you that our IRB um, is so helpful and so accessible. Um, I'm a huge fan. But all investigators, whether you're the PI or co-investigator, investigator on the study really need to understand your, what your responsibilities are and your expectations. And they're listed here for you right on the homepage of the IRB. So um, as the PI, ultimately, we want to make sure that every member of the study team not only has their current human subjects training and financial conflicts of interest on board, but those training certificates have been filed um, with the university. And Anita Franklin is the person who tracks all of that for us. Now, for those of you who have students who are going to work on studies with you, I would strongly encourage you to keep the student um, copies of those certificates also on file um, for your own end. And then um, you may also want to do that for your team members. So um, I think the most important step for this is that they do it and that they have it on file with the university. Um, of course, the PI also has oversight to the actual IRB application itself. We have wonderful template documents that make this process very easy. And if you're following that proposal template that I gave you last week, you'll find that a lot of that you can lift out and put into the IRB. So it's really nice. Um, you want to, again, talk about all your forms and append those forms and your consent forms that you're going to be using in the study as part of your application. And we talked about using those final approved, the stamped forms during the study. But there are some other things that you should know about in navigating with the IRB. So something happens. Maybe you had some students working with you and they graduated and the study is going to go for another three or four months. So you need to notify the IRB with an addendum if there's any change in study personnel. Um, we did a, a study where we thought we were only going to have um, head and neck cancer patients who were going through radiation. And we realized very quickly that a lot of the people we were recruiting had a type of head and neck cancer that would also require concurrent chemotherapy. We didn't think through that at the beginning, but as it turns out, a lot of the, the individuals who were being referred to our clinic from who we were going to recruit, uh, it was we were just never going to be able to get our numbers if we limited it to people who only got radiation therapy. So we did an addendum and we changed the um, inclusion criteria to people who are also getting concurrent chemotherapy. So stuff happens. You just need to let the IRB know and there's forms for that to use. Um, of course, we talked about adverse events reporting. Um, there's also an annual interim report that goes to the IRB if your clinical trial goes beyond one year as well as a final closeout report. Um, and that tells the IRB the study is over, your data collection is finished, and it includes things like how many people did you screen, how many people actually were enrolled and consented, how many people dropped out, things like that. So um, you wanna always track that information and be ready to go. And somehow in your own administrative plan, remember the dates at which these annual reports are due. So on the IRB's website, you can find information about what these reporting requirements are in the case of someone having a serious adverse event. So a serious adverse event um, are really things that are unexpected, serious, um, or suggest that you're 
research plan places people at risk that's greater than what you maybe originally thought about. So, you know, maybe you're testing a new product and all of a sudden you have a really high percentage of people who are having severe allergic reactions to it. Um, you know, nobody saw that coming. So these are the kinds of problems that really need to be made known very, very quickly, especially those um, that are life-threatening and or fatal. So if you have a really serious adverse event um, that's in any way possibly related to your research, it has to be reported to the IRB within 24 hours of learning the event. And my personal advice to you is don't wait that long. Um, if there's some other kinds of problems that involve risks to subjects or um, things that are related to non-compliance or, um, you know, again, an accident maybe, um, then you can see the bullet points listed there. So if, if it meets all three of the following criteria in these bullet points, you have to report it. So an unexpected uh, reaction in terms of nature, severity, or frequency related or possibly related to somebody's participation in the research, or again, that um, what's happening to them places them at a greater risk of harm than what you thought about beforehand. Um, so again, I think you want to look this up on the IRB's website and become familiar with this. Many um, sponsored projects will actually require you to have something that's called a data safety uh, plan that goes up along with your clinical trial. And the reporting of adverse events is built into that particular plan. And it's often a separate document, depending on who you're working with. So in this era of COVID, the university now has been working with the IRB to, to put some additional protections in place, most notably to understand what the mitigation strategies are that you as the investigator are using to reduce the risk of likelihood that a subject could contract COVID um, as a participant in an ATSU study. So we now have um, a new form that has to be filled out. It's um, a restart form, if you will. If you go onto the IRB's website, you'll find it in the drop down menu of forms. And essentially what you want to talk about is, um, you know, you have to really justify that you need to be doing this research and seeing human subjects and, and what are you doing to keep them safe. Now, I can tell you here in the dental school, because if you're safe enough to be a patient in one of our clinics, you will be safe enough in a clinical trial that involves a dental exam or procedure because all of those dental um, study visits would have to parallel what our dental school policies and procedures are for infection control. And we have you know, very strict policies in place now, in addition to what we've always had in place that are specifically related to COVID. And so in terms of you know, pre-screening patients with questions and temperature checks and all of these kinds of things. So you have to fill out a form and talk about what you're doing in your site, or if you're going to work in a different site than here with it at the university, you know, what are the kinds of protections that are in place there. And you're going to have to also document any COVID-related unplanned changes, um, you know, uh, and contingency measures, you know, and that might also include uh, a stopping plan for this study. Um, and again, your justification for keeping people in the study and how are you going to document serious adverse events if a subject gets COVID, um, even though I think it, it will be pretty difficult to to be able to confirm that the person contracted COVID as a result of being in a study. Um, but you have to think through that and um, present that to the IRB now with this additional documentation. So the other big administrative responsibility, of course, is training. And training relates to all members of your study team. If you're going to have multiple people conduct um, uh, study procedures, examining subjects, you have to do inter-rater reliability. We recommend that you actually come up with a, an inter-rater reliability plan. You might want to talk to the biostatistician about it. How many subjects are you going to use, like pretend subjects for this little pre-experiment, if you will. Um, and you also want to do it, I think, at some point during the course of the study to kind of make sure that everybody is still scoring things uh, consistently. And again, get a consultation with the statistician of guidance about how many of those cases you should be doing for those kinds of reliability um, activities. I think it's important to have um, 
team schedules of who's going to be doing what and when and uh, assigning tasks to the study team and conducting team meetings. And the other thing I'll mention is before the study even gets really going, you want to determine authorship order and actually assign writing tasks so that people can be working on those things while the study is in process, in progress. Can you be working on the background? Somebody could be writing up the methods section, for example. Um, and I think those expectations are good to set in advance, but to also help everybody know where things are going to land once you're finished with your data analysis and ready to write up and disseminate your results. So uh, some of this I've already talked about, but um, again, oversight for data collection, coding, and entry. The PI is typically also responsible and usually working with someone else on the team to what we call clean the data set um, so to look for missing data. Um, there are codes to use for missing data. You would want to work with your statistician. They can advise you how they would like that to be coded, but you don't want to just you know hand over a data set that's kind of all over the place. Um, and it's the PI's responsibility to put eyes on that final data set and approve it to move forward to the statistician for analysis. And then the PI will work quite closely with the statistician um, to go through data analysis plans and interpretation. And then typically the PI is the person who drafts the final study report that goes back to the study sponsor on behalf of the team. So you would write this, the final report first, let the study team look at it, everybody kind of talks through it and edits it before it goes on to the study sponsor. And then, of course, you want everybody to have a role in, um, you know, the closeout and manuscript um, uh, preparation as well as dissemination and presentation at meetings. So these are all some of the things you work out in advance. So I thought we would now just take a couple of minutes. I would share with you what I think are rules to live by. And these are really just based on my 30 plus years in doing all different kinds of research projects and a lot of hard lessons that I learned from clinical trials. So um, I think the best lessons are the ones we learn when things go wrong. And I want you to be able to learn from some of my mistakes and um, help you be more successful. So the first rule is probably the most important one is, and that is never, ever, ever think that you can do a clinical trial by yourself. You can't, it's too hard. And I'll, I'll just tell you, save yourself the aggravation because your study will likely fail before it even really gets up and off the ground. And really, in my opinion, there's there are no exceptions to that rule. In all of my years, I've done one, one clinical trial by myself and it was brutal. So always have at least one partner in crime working with you, but to have a team uh, makes it certainly uh, a lot easier and it tends to run much more smoothly. The second rule to live by is, is a rule that I say to you from my heart and from a lot of things that I've learned along the way. And to me, honestly, it's the most important rule. And that is, I want you to think very, very carefully before you take on a clinical trial, because Clinical trials, unlike any other kind of study, are consuming, and they will consume you physically, mentally, and emotionally. And you need support from a lot of people. And in, in all honesty, 100% from my heart, I will tell you, the very first person I talk to about whether or not I'm going to do a clinical trial is my husband, because when the clinical trial is in progress, the clinical trial is priority. And there are lots of things that happen in life that really don't allow for the intrusion of a clinical trial. And you have to weigh that very carefully and know where you are. So I, I want you to, to really understand what it takes. So I talked to my husband first, then I talked to Dr. Trombley, my dean. And Dr. Trombley knows that on days when the clinical trial is in progress, you know, I, I'm sort of uh, off limits to anybody else who needs access to me in terms of my time and attention. Because as the PI or as, you know, the, the assistant dean for research, my eyes have to be on that trial. And you need to have support. Um, and we have, again, wonderful support systems with the university sponsored programs, research support. Um, but you have to really think about it because whether we like it or not, the clinical trial becomes a priority. 
So rule number three, you have to allow enough time for planning. And I know sometimes my students get very frustrated with me because I make them spend so much time designing their studies, even little tiny trials and little little studies. The most work is going to happen up front. The better you plan, the better you think it through, the easier it goes. Implementation should be relatively straightforward, and it only happens that way if you've planned adequately. So in my opinion, it's actually the most important part of this study, and it always takes more time than whatever you think about. So there may be some other kinds of um, time constraints that will influence this, you know, like, uh, do you have a grant? And so you have to think about the deadlines for that. Um, do you want to be able to have a certain amount of data collected because you want to apply to present at a certain international meeting that only, you know, that meeting only comes up every other year or every Every couple of years. Um, so you have to kind of think about some of those things. Um, the facilities, where are you going to actually hold this study? Is it, Are they actually going to be available to you to use when you hope to be using them? You know, here at the dental school, we have to think about, you know, when are clinical board exams scheduled? You know, when are other groups maybe sharing um, a space that we want to use for a clinical trial? Is it actually going to be available? Who's available to work on it? Um, lots of things to think about. And again, we talked about many of these aspects as uh, we talked through last week and then some of the administration administrative tasks. Rules to live by, use the amazing resources that are available at our university. Again, can't say enough about it. I'm a huge fan. Uh, research support for everything from writing to um, help if you need with some of the management aspects. You just need some people to kind of toss things around and who help me connect to somebody within the university who's done something similar to what I'm thinking about. We already talked about how vital sponsored programs division is to clinical trials, but I have to tell you, I love our librarians. To me, librarians are critical members of the research team because they really help you to get the background information that you need in order to design your study. Love them and they're wonderful. Biostatisticians, love them, great, terrific, easy to work with. And we have them across um, both of our campuses, or actually all three of our campuses um, can access the biostatisticians in both of our states. So use them, love the IRB. Um, they've made things so easy for us um, with the templates that they've developed, such a comprehensive website. And then, you know, the best other resources are, are us. Like <laughs> we can use each other, faculty and staff, um, who've had experience doing some of these things, you just want somebody to bounce things by or want somebody to work with you and collaborate. So lots of great resources to use. Uh, love our biostatisticians. My next advice, meet with them regularly. Um, I think you can never involve a biostatistician too soon. So sometimes I've been known to contact our statisticians to say, hey, I kind of have this idea. I'm like flirting with doing a study about this and to sit down and kind of process it through. Um, but they are really important people who can help you to figure out, well, what should you measure? How should you measure it? How many people do you need for your sample size? your power analysis, your inner rate of reliability activities, how are you going to capture your data and code it, and what's your analysis plan. So when you think about what are the questions we're asking, you want to make sure, sounds crazy, but what you're doing is actually going to yield the data you need to answer your questions. And there's nothing worse, by the way, than going through a study and at the end, you realize, I didn't get what I needed to be able to answer a specific question. Um, your analysis plan for statistics is actually part of that proposal plan. It should be done and well-developed long before data collection ever begins, right? So there's no guesswork. Now, sometimes you have a very large data set and, and you may think of some other opportunities depending upon how your results are trending. You might say, hey, wouldn't it be neat if we compare this with that and let's see how it goes. So that would be like a secondary analysis, but you should know where you're going before you start collecting data, right? So I, I think, uh, I think uh, Kurt Bay is on this uh, uh, call, so he's going to like this one. Always remember that biostatisticians are our friends, and they are not miracle workers. So you can't just hand them a pile of data and expect them to turn it into something 
if you didn't really have a plan for it beforehand. And I mean, obviously, that's pretty straightforward. So as great as our statisticians are, you know, again, it's much better if they're involved in the process. And then always being prepared, like we talked about, having a clean, complete data set. Um, and then and then not expecting them to turn things around in 30 seconds because you've decided to apply to a meeting and the deadline is tomorrow at 8 a.m. You know, we can't expect them to do some of those things. So, um, and they should be credited appropriately on the projects that you're doing in your dissemination activities. Uh, my next rule to live by is always select your study team purposefully and carefully. Um, you know, do they have the right qualifications, the availability, the interest? Um, if they, they aren't qualified, but they want to learn and they'd like to be trained, these are great opportunities. We love to involve novice investigators and students on our projects. Um, it's always great to have another pair of hands. They have to be trained. You have to make a commitment as the PI to work with those individuals. Um, and then also making sure that people are comfortable in the role which they're going to be assigned on a trial. So like if you're used to being the PI and now you're going to be in a study and that's not going to be your role, you, know, you have to be willing to be able to step out of those shoes and to, to do what you've been assigned. So these are all important and honest conversations that you need to have with your team members. And part of this is setting clear and realistic expectations for not only yourself, but also for the team. Um, you might be familiar with what we call SMART goals. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and that everybody on the team has to understand that the subjects are always the first priority in the trial. Um, the, that is um, always ranks number one in any design. So secondary is that, you know, the activities, the trial um, are good for the study, right? So anything that we're doing as a team, you know, prioritize the good of the study second, and then the good of the individual team members third, right? So um, participants first, the study second, and all of us as individuals third. Um, this is an important life lesson. There's no such thing as a day off from a clinical trial when the trial is in progress. It doesn't happen. And that's because you have to be prepared. There's got, maybe going to be an adverse event you're going to have to respond to. People have life emergencies, family emergencies. So that means that stuff comes up, you know, um, the school gets closed because maybe there was a flood in the lobby, whatever it is. Um, you're going to have to figure out how to manage that if you're scheduled with subjects to be seen. So here's what I said about, you know, SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And then just some guidelines for you about setting good communication uh, expectations, right, strategies. So there you go, that's for your own knowledge. So um, I love to give examples. So here's the case of the unexpected adverse event. We're doing a big, large study, oh, over oh, just shy of 90 subjects in the study. I was so excited because I, it was a Friday and I finally had what I thought was a day off. I live an hour from the campus. So, you know, it's really nice to not have a two hour commute on a given day. And I had a subject call me at 1130 in the morning and she was having a negative reaction to a, a project. And so my day off officially ended. So um, I talked with the person. Uh, we quickly determined she was having an allergic reaction to the project, to the product. And of course, as you probably know, the problem with allergic reactions is they can sometimes be delayed and they can get worse. Um, she wasn't having any difficulty breathing, but I immediately arranged for somebody who was actually on site and we actually had a team member who was on site. And that person was uh, examined within 20 minutes. But meanwhile, I'm in the car and I'm driving down to school because I'm the PI. And uh, the team member knew exactly what to do, what the documentation was to photograph the reaction and knew how to manage that person appropriately. Um, but as the PI, it's my responsibility, ultimate oversight. So to check the forms, the paperwork, everything's filled out. Uh, we withdrew the person from the subject because uh, this individual uh, from the study, this subject could no longer participate because of the reaction to the um, product. I immediately got in touch with the IRB and the study sponsor that same day and then followed up with that subject that night, the next morning right? And multiple times over the weekend and Monday morning. So that's what I mean. You don't have a day off. Stuff happens. And the study is priority, right? So training your study team, very important. Um, hosting regular meetings. We talked about a lot of these kinds of things. And you want to have meetings at different points during this study. And uh, if you're going to do um, um, 
multiple people going through inner rate of reliability exercises, you want to actually have a database um, that you set up separately for that kind of information as part of your team training, uh, because you're going to work with the statistician to do analyses on that data set. So keep them separate. Uh, and that's the kind of information you want to have in your study manuscript as well. Next rule is always draft a schedule and share it with the team. I try to actually involve my team members in scheduling study uh, schedules and in, in thinking them through, because if there's going to be a couple of us examining subjects, we all have to know, well, like, hey, I can't do this on Mondays or I teach class on Wednesday, whatever it is. So you kind of work together to put the plan together in place. But you can't just look for um, the short term, you have to think about, okay, when are the holidays coming? When is the university closed? Is there a religious holiday that you want to observe? And so you're going to be taking personal time off. Do you have a family vacation? Um, how does the scheduling coincide with other kinds of deadlines, grant review, uh, grant reports, things like that. So um, very nice to have your team involved in this and then having a backup plan. Like if somebody says, Jay, you know, something came up, I can't be there on my scheduled day on Tuesday, somebody else um, on the team can cover that shift. So timing is everything. So this is just kind of a list of things to be thinking about. You know, when are we going to start the different study phases? And if we have a certain plan, you know, how many people do we have moved through enrollment, moved through the first phase of the study, et cetera, and how it goes over the course of your overall study period. So just some things to kind of think about, again, during the planning phase. Next piece of advice, select tools that have established reliability and validity whenever humanly possible. <laughs> um, using established indices makes life so much easier. If you use original tools, you actually have to test them to make sure that they're going to perform in the way you want them to perform. And that adds a lot of extra burden onto you as the investigator. And if you're not sure, work with the librarians to help you find tools and talk with your biostatisticians. So, it's pretty neat now a lot of our respective disciplines actually have guidance documents that they've published. This is an example of what we have in dentistry where so, sort of the big name researchers for certain oral diseases have come together as a group and they have a set of guidelines. So if you want to study bad breath or you want to study, you know, periodontal disease, they actually will give you guidance documents with the recommended indices. They talk a lot about reliability and validity. And it's just so helpful. So in your own discipline, you might want to check it out to, to see if you have those. We already talked about checklists. They're so fantastic. They reduce errors all the way across the board. And really, most importantly, I think help to prevent missing data. I'm, I'm kind of a, a control freak when it comes to, to data. I really dislike missing data. And so checklists I find are quite helpful um, with this. And again, they can be used in all aspects of this study. The next rule kind of close to that with the checklist is to do a walkthrough before you actually start the study. Um, and I have a little example here, a true story for you. So I was a very young investigator back in Baltimore and I was um, uh, going to work on a big clinical trial at Johns Hopkins in the leukemia ward. And we had it all planned out and I met with the nurses who are part of the study team who were leading the study team. And I was gonna do exams on these um, patients in the leukemia unit. And I show up to do my my first exam and I'm too short to reach the patient. The patient is in an elevated bed with the rails up and they're in the center and they're hooked up to all kinds of wires and devices and I quite literally could not reach the patient. So this is an example of why you always want to do a walkthrough before you actually start a real study visit. And uh, Mark Schlossman and I do a lot of projects together. This is a habit that we have um, developed. We will actually physically go to the space. We, we do a pretend study visit. We set up with everything we think we're going to need and we kind of walk through and we say, oh, where are we going to keep this? We're going to move this over here. You know, oh, we forgot we need a pen or whatever it is. And we actually think through all of the steps. I can't even tell you how helpful this is. You might actually want to have a laminated checklist if you have to do, say, a, you know, a dozen procedures during a study visit so that you know. And you can just read it off. You can keep it right next to where you're working. We always laminate them because then we can disinfect them, right? So think about that. Do a walkthrough. 
set it up, lock it up and forget it. Don't touch the setup. So if you're going to do something in a trial where something has to be calibrated, a piece of equipment, you want to have it in a place where it's calibrated and nobody's going to mess around with it. I actually did a study in my dissertation where I was doing um, um, a whole host of electrical, electrical physiologic measures on muscles in the head and neck region. And unbeknownst to me, um, somebody came in and moved all my equipment to another location because they decided there was another trial that needed to take place in the space where I was already set up. And I had to go back. It took me two weeks. I had to recalibrate everything. The fluorescent lighting influenced the uh, electrical activity in the room. It was a disaster. So figure it out, put it in a place, and don't mess with it during the study. Um, we talked about how you're going to plan your study supplies, <laughs> like where are you going to put all this stuff? This is another true story. Friday afternoon here in my building, uh, we had a sponsor deliver 200 cases of oral care products that came on these huge pallets. So it's Friday afternoon. You know, here I am. Nobody can walk in the lobby and I got to figure out how I'm going to move all this stuff and I need to get help to move it. So always think about this. We talked about it. When is it going to get there? Where's it going to go? Can we deliver it to the right place? How are we going to organize it, unpack it and store it? Um, again, critical rule to live by. Whenever possible, prepare all your study documents in advance and have them in the area where you're going to work. So if you're going to make study binders, have them all done. You know, make all your photocopies that you need, have a stuffing party and put all your labels on. Be ready to go with all the forms that you need to have before you launch. We talked about data security. It's so critical. You have to think through very carefully your data security measures. And as a PI, you have to enforce them fully. So remember the IRB asks you about how you are going to secure your data. And you have to comply with what you tell them you're going to do. So if, if you're going to say, I'm going to store it in a locked file, well, do you have a locked file? You might have to buy one. And then where are you going to put it, right? So how long are you going to keep this? Who has access to those things? You Use password protected electronic files on university computers. Know and monitor who has access to those study files. And remember, HIPAA compliance is mandatory, right? So your study can get shut down if there's any kind of violation. So this data safety management plan, I think is a good thing for you to work through and develop. And I can um, give you some advice on some of that if you need it. I think the, this one is, uh, again, pretty easy, except problems are going to arise and respond quickly um, whenever you can. And as the PI, it's certainly really critical for you to do that. So identify the problem, figure out, and then report it and manage it as indicated. Uh, second to last one is accept that you're human and so are your study subjects. You know, stuff happens, life happens. I've never gone through a trial where everything was perfect. We've gotten pretty close, but you just can't control everything. And you have to forgive yourself when things go wrong. But most importantly, you have to ask for and be willing to accept help. This is something I still work on on a regular basis. So trust your team and let your team have your back as the PI. Um, they're such an important part of the success of a study. And then whenever you can, you want to shut it off at the end of the day. It's not always easy to do. Um, you know, when we we work with our cancer patients. We get very close to them and we care a lot about them. And there are times when you can't um, and you will take it home with you. But um, whenever possible, try to try to close it out at the end of the day. And last but not least, we made it through this Herculean amount of material. Have a good time because <laughs> learning new things and conducting research are supposed to be fun. So I hope you enjoy the ride and thank you all so much for spending this time with me. So I think we are out of time, unfortunately. But um, anyway, uh, I will hang out for a second if anybody has any questions or thoughts they want to share. Thanks, Inder. Had to head out for his next meeting. Great. Thanks, Anne. That was great. Thanks, Kurt. Appreciate it. 
Okay, well, as always, I will make the, the slides um, uh, available to everyone. Feel free to use all of these things. And um, I'm so happy to be a resource for you to help you as you navigate uh, taking on a clinical trial. So thanks everybody so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.